we're going to get started with our, with our webinar. The IRNI initiative is a collaboration between the Economic Development Administration and the University Economic Development Association. I'm Sheila Martin, Executive Director of the IRNI initiative, and the initiative is designed to build diverse networks of university officials um, and their ecosystem partners to advance equity and resilience goals and to improve the effectiveness of EDA funded university centers. Um, the, through these networks that we're building, we'll encourage sharing of best practices and building capacity of network members. We'll develop resources to help universities improve their practices and identify gaps in economic development practices with recommendations for closing these gaps for achieving greater equity, resilience, and leverage in partnership with EDA and its programs. We'll bring you monthly convenings like these. Normally, we're at, we're at noon on the first Wednesday of each month, um, but today we're actually joined by the UE to Place Network, so that's why our timing is a little bit different um, this month. Um, and you'll be able to access the full speaker biographies and materials from the webinar, as well as discussions about the topics that we're covering in the ARNI webinars um, on the Member 365 platform. Um, the Member 365 platform is free to join. And um, we, we're, the link to join that platform is, um, is there on the slide. And um, I will also put it in the chat in just a moment. Um, so um, I'm, I'm pleased now um, to introduce our um, today's UIDA board host for the session, Teresa Merriweather Arak. Dr. Teresa Merriweather Arak is an expert on economic and business innovation. While her career has spanned more than 30 years of experience across grants, government contract management, economic development, government and higher education, she currently serves as the inaugural director of the Center for Entrepreneurship, Innovation and Economic Development at Alabama A&M University. She's a UIDA board member and co-chair of the ARNI project. Teresa. Thank you so very much. And welcome to our participants in today's uh, webinar. We appreciate you joining us and, and thank you, Sheila. So just to give you an overview of UIDA um, and the wonderful work that we are, are doing and will be doing in the future. Uh, our vision uh, is and its uh, members will be the leaders in advancing regional economic engagement fueled by ed higher education. Uh, we were founded in 1976. The University Economic Development Association is an international organization dedicated to strengthening the relationship between higher education and key public-private partners to fuel modern economic development. And our mission, of course, is to service members by promoting knowledge and practice in the realms of talent, innovation, and place as drivers of regional prosperity. We encourage each of you uh, to become members of UEDA. Uh, and in doing so, you will become part of an active and growing network of higher education and economic development stakeholders, working to create the conditions for maximum economic and social potential. You will receive news and information through members only communication. There will be significant collaboration with national economic development stakeholders. You'll also, which is very important now, have access to post to the EDA job board and there will be discount rates uh, to the association's annual summit. Also, there's free online programming and webinar access. So we are, are so interested in you uh, joining. There's collaboration on grants and regional initiatives uh, with members. Also, there's contribution of content to UEDA's newsletter and publication. 
And one of the best practices that we have been able to establish and sustain over the years is unlimited awards of excellence for those best practice programs that are occurring uh, nationally. Again, there's member discounts on partner products and services and access to the APLU IEP University designation program. Uh, and so the various networks, of course, includes the three pillows, uh, the talent, talent network, uh, which occurs every second Wednesday of the month at 11 a.m. Eastern and 8, 8 a.m. Uh, Pacific. And of course, the second pillow is that of Innovation Network, which occurs every third Wednesday. And then, of course, Place Network, which occurs every fourth Wednesday. We encourage each of you to take advantage of these wonderful opportunities and also share the information with your colleagues and friends. We have some exciting opportunities that are coming up uh, within the association and we certainly want you to become a very critical part of those opportunities. Thank you, Teresa. Now it's my pleasure to turn the program over to our moderator for the session today, Jenny, Mizatowicz. Jenny is Manager of Economic Development Initiative for the University of Texas at Dallas. And in this role, Jenny builds meaningful partnerships between the university and North Texas employers, serving as a neutral arbit arbit arbitrator excuse me, of workforce data for regional economic development partners. And she helps position UT Dallas as an economic engine for the region. She's also helping design a strategy to develop the university's 100 plus acres of remaining land. Jenny currently serves on the UIDA board and on the UIDA Awards of Excellence Committee. Take it away, Jenny. Thank you, Sheila, and welcome everyone. So I see lots of attendees that are part of the Place Affinity Network. And we've found a topic this month that really um, addresses both how a university can influence a community sense of place, while also uh, being mindful of initiatives focused on equity, inclusion, and sustainability. And that is the eco districts model. And so our speaker for the session is Sarah Heineke. And um, I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about Sarah. Sarah is the founder and principal of, of Veritas, a public outreach and community strategies firm. Sarah has over 30 years of experience in project management, research, and outreach. She has facilitated countless public participation events, and she specializes in developing approaches with communities and individuals who may experience barriers to entry with conventional outreach processes. Recent work includes programs to elevate mutually beneficial solutions with communities experiencing houselessness and events designed to solicit participation in community ownership of new vision for a Veterans Peace Memorial. Sarah has expert knowledge in managing complex projects with multiple stakeholders. She has had deep experience in higher education student services, public sector development, and nonprofit management. She has managed co-curricular programs for undergraduate and graduate institution, commercial retrofits, new construction, and multi-million dollar capital improvement projects for the city of Portland, and complex collective benefit agreements, which established, measured, and reported climate, equity, and resilience outcomes over time for corporate stakeholders. Sarah has a bachelor's degree from University of Chicago and a master's degree in urban and regional planning from Portland State University. So we are pleased to welcome Sarah to the, pl the place and Arnie convening. Take it away, Sarah. Thanks, thanks, Jenny. Um, I am so happy to be here and um, let me share my slides. So good morning, everyone. My name is Sarah Heineke. I'm the, as Jenny mentioned, the principal of Veritas, a strategic planning communication consulting practice located here in Portland, Oregon. Um, I started this company to do the, the work full time uh, that I love the most, which is working to help communities of all kinds find their ways back to each other. The work I do is listening, hypothesizing, proposing, designing, and doing that in relationship with individuals in governments, nonprofits, firms, institutions, and neighborhoods. 
I'm here today to talk about the eco district framework from a designer and practitioner point of view, meaning I developed and, and led Portland's first eco district for 10 years. I'm an eco district's accredited professional and can speak to the ideas and the implementation of this framework. I'm talking to Uida and Arnie in the meeting of talent, place and equity because Sheila, Jenny and I all felt that this framework certification system, the protocol, the community of practice might in fact be a very useful model for the work you all do in reference to the foundations for strategy and practice around ECDEV in a higher ed setting, the guidance for program and projects that fall under talent innovation in place to my mind, seem to be very much in line with the Eco Districts framework. I am struck at once by the opportunity for Eco Districts to be a launching pad for thinking about how universities can get into action and right relationship with the communities they are part of, especially with respect to the equity resilience work that is so critically important today. Um, so in terms of what we're gonna talk about today, um, basically, we'll go into what our eco districts. So that's probably something that maybe some I know Tim is familiar with that, but maybe others others of you are not familiar with it with this framework. And then, really, how has this framework evolved to completely center racial equity to apply to it? And then, what are the implications for a higher fire for higher ed economic? Um, and community engagement, which, which includes development. And then hopefully we can go into some questions and answers from you all. So I'm talking you, to you today about eco districts centering racial equity, but I will tell you that it hasn't always been this way in the framework. The, the framework, the, the work of urban planners and developers um, has come a long way starting as an economic development strategy for the in this case for eco districts, starting as an ECDEV strategy for the city of Portland and a way for developers to find a way to green building and placemaking through strong support of district scale infrastructure investments like district water, district energy and waste. Um, but issues of equity have always been at the center of this work, whether we acknowledge it and support communities or if we kick the can down the road for a few more years. These slides show places in the eco district that I led, and they are two blocks away from each other. One shows a marquee project of, uh, which is called Haslow on 8th, and it's a platinum lead development. It has a black water recovery system and um, market rate housing and commercial development. The other is a monthly vigil for a 25 year old young black man who was shot 26 times while sitting in his car after being pulled over for not signaling and looking like a gangster. I am starting with this slide because I wanna share with you something about my journey with the Eco District Framework and frankly, the planning and development profession that I've been a part of for 25 years. When I started the Lloyd Eco District, the most difficult part of this job was convincing developers of the green building pro value proposition. We talked about triple bottom line, people, planet, profit. But what was true was that the reverse order of that was what made the world go round. And that convincing developers to consider green projects was possible, but only if it was cost neutral. The part of the people part of the equation, if it ever came up, was around very soft targets like productivity gains in high performing buildings or overall satisfaction with placemaking, human scale streetscapes, ground floor retail and green space bonuses. Um, occasionally, and, and obviously there were also really aggressive green building targets as well, um, but usually not in terms of how they were impacting people. And I'll also say that when we pulled off a green project, we all felt pretty proud of ourselves. We were saving the planet. We were the good guys. Planet, platinum lead is very hard to do. So maybe if we were even very good, we even figured out how to incorporate some minority women in emerging small business firms in, some, some, in, in subcontracting or working with some at-risk youth on a beautification project. And besides the trickle down benefits of building urban 
planned green neighborhoods flow to everyone eventually, right? So the slide on the right being a platinum lead development that is basically something that signified what was possible when money and power lined up to do the right thing. In this hopeful place, permitting bureaus expedited permits. They shared ownership agreements and, and made those agreements between property owners and utilities. Property managers instructed their market rate tenants how to operate their living machine, the black water recycling mechanism and one of the first in the country to operate in office and residential context. This, this project, the Hassel and Eighth project in my eco district brought in jobs and residents and attention to a neighborhood that needed all those improvements. But not only were there two Lloyds, there were at least two Lloyds, but planning and development professionals really didn't have a way of thinking about how or why to center equity in projects. So though a monthly vigil had been on that site ever since Keith noticed death in, in 2010, which was when the Eco District started, it wasn't until late 2019 that Lloyd Eco District got involved with the organizers to support the Black community's vision for action and expressions of Black love. And I will tell you that it wasn't a foregone conclusion that this was a project that we should be involved in. Like many developers and community placemakers, the relationship of social justice to planning, placemaking, and development to displacement and the social determinants of health, wealth, and freedom weren't and aren't widely acknowledged. It took over 10 years and a crisis in the form of a pandemic and social reckoning movement for projects to, to, for projects to center equity and take the center stage in the eco districts framework but I suspect that there are many of you in the university setting who still feel like the difficult work of getting institutional property owners to invest in waste prevention, renewable energy, and alternative transportation is still very difficult to do. And there may be some frustration in adding even more complexity to the equation. But that is what I'm saying. We actually do have to do better. And yes, it is more complex. If your green building value proposition is really centering the financial bottom line, then financial value is the value we create. We don't create the other values, really. They're sort of adjacent to it. We make agreements to be less bad instead of creating a case for doing good, which involves power and resource, resource sharing. The Eco District's framework now squarely centers not just equity, but racial equity in the projects it guides. I'm including a fair amount of the story leading up to this current moment because this transformative moment is where we all live. And I think you may be able to see yourselves and your projects in this journey. So back to early days. Um, first of all, eco districts are uh, two things. The organization called Eco Districts, which has merged with Partnership for, so for Southern Equity and the planning and development idea with a small e, eco districts um, as, a, as an idea or as a thing that is out there in the world being done by different neighborhoods and districts and, and small cities. Eco districts started in Portland, Oregon as a city of Portland Act Dev initiative. And there were four basic objectives to build a sustainability center, um, to create a or develop a vehicle for architecture and, and engineering firms to sell their services, to promote the Portland brand and basically win bigger, better contracts outside of the region, to develop that sector and to find, to find a way to showcase Portland expertise in planning green building through the Portland Sustainability Institute and to activate those projects in urban renewal areas with green building and urban planning concepts or eco districts. Initially, there were five eco districts and it was absolutely a Portland centric economic development program, but political winds shifted, the other goals fell away and, eco, and the eco districts idea remained and grew into a framework and a development strategy for neighborhoods anywhere. It became a protocol, the, the steps to take for certification the framework, the conceptual underpinnings, um, eventually became an AP certification for practitioners and, um, and offered things like a charrette and incubator products that allowed cities to do a deep dive on ideas and partnership building. 
And from that, a community of practice developed naturally as the ideas gained traction. So the framework basically involves a fairly simple idea of declaring your imperatives around equity, resilience, climate protection, developing a roadmap agenda around the priorities that have been set aside as place, prosperity, health, health and well-being, connectivity, living in infrastructure, resource generation, and then developing a roadmap in order to follow through on those things. So the protocol is a, is a formal process. Uh, it's really an uh, amazing sort of standard for urban and community development. And the certification system starts again in this sort of stepwise way where uh, community members create commitments to each other and the process. They form a collaborative governance. They establish what priorities they will seek uh, in the process of developing the eco district through the roadmap process. And then in implementation, um, we measure and evaluate whether those projects and ideas have come to fruition and whether they've been successful. And certification as, a, as an eco district is a very rigorous process. Um, it isn't necessary, just like lead certification isn't necessary to build and operate a green building. But we all know that saying you'll do it and having a third party rigorous verification and accountability to do a thing yield di different outcomes. Certification right now is somewhat in limbo as eco districts and uh, the partnership for Southern equity as they integrate as organizations. Um, once that's fully realized, the, the process of eco district certification, certification will be, um, will emerge in a new format and a new, slightly new framework. Um, but it is a process that's um, underway and probably ready in about early 2023, I think. With only six eco districts certified after 10 years, after the organization has been around for 10 years, there has been some criticism that the process may be too difficult, that the barrier is too high. So it'll be interesting to see if anything, if what, if anything, the PSC eco districts integration develops in response to that. So there's a, a number of different kinds of projects just to sort of give you a sense of this isn't just for one, you know, greenfield development or new districts or so it could be new districts, it could be existing districts. So my district is Lloyd there. It's uh, infill Metro Health is in Cleveland. East Harbor is a, a brand new um, development in Toronto. Sun Valley is privately led. Capitol Hill in Seattle is publicly led. Aetna in the Triborough, Aetna, Sharpsburg, Mill, Millvale, Pittsburgh, uh, Triborough area is community led. So lots of different sort of um, ways of being an eco district. And I'll just uh, give you an example of, of the pre-integration model of eco district work. Millvale is a really great sort of um, standard bearer for that. So Millvale is part of a tri-borough area of Pittsburgh. The eco district idea was generated through the, through the library and stood up by a tri-borough focused community development partners, New Sun Rising, who work with Evolve EA, a local design and development team who guided the community through a series of iterations and project ideas to bring life back to this dying mill town. Projects were centered on on flood control, food scarcity, solar power, and community building. And equity was thought of in terms of vulnerable populations, which in most cases meant people experiencing poverty. It meant being responsive to residents. It meant creating community gardens and helping people find connections to each other. And similarly, in the eco district, I led in Lloyd, we were doing similar kinds of community-based projects like a bike pollinator a corridor, um, age-friendly business designations for elderly residents, uh, building a shelter for houseless residents. Um, and we were also trying to find program income for organizations by creating a program that 
had us organizing LED retrofits, incentives and discounts and bundling all that together in exchange for a small portion of profit share that we would get and that would, which then we also shared with an affordable housing developer, which, you know, all of those projects, the ones in Millvale and the ones in Lloyd, those were impressive triple bottom line projects that um, according to the standards that we set for ourselves as urban planners and community developers were impressive, but the financial bottom line, especially in those LED retrofits, so very complicated project, um, the financial bottom line was always the big winner. And this, this slide is actually from a slide deck from Lloyd um, where we're talking about mutuality. Um, and, you know, in those days, we really talked about our, our value proposition and our, um, our ability to really run with the big dogs and, and come up with returns on investment on projects that not only were successful to our partners in corporate headquarters buildings, but also would potentially stream us some income. And it didn't feel complicit, it felt smart. Um, what I'm struck by is that these are all laudable achievements and are indeed impressive compared to what drives conventional development without intervention from community developers. But as true as that is, it still isn't enough to truly create an equity, equitable, resilient and climate protected future because we never really let the environment or the people really carry the priority. And the problem with claiming a triple bottom line when the, each of these lines are not equal is that it ignores the societal stresses that are developing alongside these gains. So when we don't ask who is benefiting and who is burdened by this project, you might in fact be hollowing out the most vulnerable communities in the city in service to neighborhoods that are now fun places to work, live and play. And with the pandemic and racial justice uprisings of 2020, what is laid bare especially in a place like Portland, is how fragile these gains are and how extensive the losses to the broader community are. The pandemic was a test of resilience and eco districts should have come out ahead. Maybe some did, but because the equity and resilience were not centered in projects and collaborative agreements, those legs of the three-legged stool quickly buckled and small gains of placemaking and inclusion were overwhelmed by the debts of injustice that had come due. So eco districts result, eco districts, the organization resolved to intentionally seek out a partner dedicated to race equity in the built environment. They also recognized that cross sectoral work requires a deepening of the org's capacity, perspective and partnerships to build the kind of lasting change our communities, especially our most vulnerable low income and communities of color need to overcome de decades of disinvestment and structural racism. And so from the partnership for Southern equity side, you have the, you know, from their, from that organization's perspective, you have the dueling forces of crisis and opportunity, the crisis of population pressures, growing racial and income inequality, diminishing affordable housing, decaying public infrastructure, but you have the opportunity of federal infrastructure bill, strengthening of progressive civic infrastructure, recognition of affordable housing crisis, growing recognition of the intersection of racial equity, environmental, environmental justice and climate justice. And so the two organizations agreed that it, it made sense for them to merge. Um, and so when you think of the eco-district framework merging with the goals of the partnership for Southern equity, um, the, the framework uh, being such a thoughtful and reflexive um, conceptual starting point, eco-districts was point was a position to really pivot into right relationship, but what would that centering equity really mean? Um, and so it's been a series of of many many conversations over a few years leading up to the pandemic. This was in in the works, and the pandemic just really solidified that moment um, 
a, a few really key goals were established. One, advance racial equity. So organizational partners challenged eco districts to elevate racial equity in its work, to rebalance with its sustainability framework. We disrupt systems. So build an unapologetic strategy to counter white oppression, structural racism, implicit bias within urban planning design and development industry to intentionally integrate sustainability and racial justice. So that means integration allows PSC to more strategically weave environmental perspectives within its racial equity framework. And to elevate cross-sectoral work. Cross-sectoral approaches are critical to just growth, which is the, the division under PSC that manages eco-districts now. And PSC's focus on health, energy, economic, and land development aligns with eco districts focus areas in that priorities slide. Those are very much in alignment with PSC's additional focuses within other divisions that it operates. Cultivating the agency of local leaders to drive neighborhood scale equitable development. So eco districts protocol accredited accredited professional and project certifications can accelerate PSE's efforts to train local leaders in equitable development, as well as de-risk investment in historically disinvested communities. And finally, to increase PSE's impact. So linking PSE's tools and capacities with Eco District's national footprint creates a foundation for PSE's own national expansion agenda. And so how this in internally gets expressed in eco-district principles, these are principles that, that eco-districts as a framework has always had, but how do we think about them now in terms of centering racial equity? So make collaboration inescapable has always been a priority, has always been principle. Now we think about that in terms of Yes, of course, make collaboration inescapable, but expand our vision of who is a collaborator by experience and not just education or expertise. Share that power and collaborate with everyone who is impacted by this project, whichever project we're, we're talking about. Centering equity in every decision. So who is at the table? Make, sh make certain that we are not simply forcing others to, to bend to our will in our biases, but rather strive to be transformational and not transactional. Plan for resiliency and climate disruption. So we're, we're still talking about, you know, how do these neighborhoods actually um, invest in infrastructure and projects that will withstand the, the crises and the um, stresses of climate change? But we can't only think about projects in, in physical infrastructure investment terms. We have to also think about social infrastructure and social systems that can and do keep people safe and thriving in crisis over the long term, which is especially true in, in vulnerable communities. And we have to address health and well being. This has never been a great. Um, strength of developers is addressing health and well-being, but by understanding the social determinants of health, we underscore that every project has the power to impact health either positively or negatively, and we need to show up in a way that um, acknowledges that and strives to do better. Design with nature. Um, green inf infrastructure with equity in mind means systems are designed with community values in mind. There are many, many examples of green infrastructure, parks, open spaces that have essentially led to gentrification and led to mistrust in BIPOC communities. So don't be surprised when uh, a park is on the drawing board and there's a lot of mistrust around that. Anticipate displacement pressures and work within the context of the community to determine what the values of the community are with respect to that green infrastructure. And finally, six, integrate performance indices and measure impact. So when we're focusing on indicators and indices and measuring that impact, 
or identifying indicators that improve and are indicators of agreed upon equity outcomes. So in terms of, you know, getting into the weeds a little bit in terms of that um, initial slide of the imperatives, the formation, the roadmap, the performance, all the sort of key components of eco districts, equity commitment means, you know, in the first moments of establishing an eco district, we're creating a clear collective impact vision for our commitment to addressing equity in all aspects of that work. And then once we have a formation process, we're establishing governance, we're coming up with who is the back, you know, what does the backbone institution look like and how are we, who, what, what are the other relevant uh, community organizations that are coming together around this eco district where we're creating a, a strong formation of long-term collaborative governance that represents all of the interests, needs, and participation of all of the community. Um, and the roadmap has a comprehensive and intersectional, intersectional implementation strategy and performance is a commitment to trans, transparency and trust. So these are, um, you know, very explicit ways that we can do, do development in community so much better. And I'll just um, focus a little bit more on formation. So, you know, in terms of the formation side of the uh, model, you know, we're really looking at who is around the table through all phases of planning, development, implementation. We're, we're engaging, we're, we're doing engagement to governance, not engaging for the sake of governance. We're amplifying the voices of non-traditional actors, those typically left out of development. Um, there's, there's been lip service to that in community development projects, but this framework, I think, really lays a much more uh, solid uh, process to, to really follow in terms of um, bringing people to the table and amplifying their voices. And then finally, those in redevelopment need to really understand that this work goes beyond good intentions and many communities that we're working with and that are within the higher ed setting for sure, um, surrounding universities are coming to developments in this context in a place of deep mistrust. Project scoping that creates a focus on building community power and resource control are key, looking to shape these district investments by sharing decision-making and shared resources is part of the collective impact model where the community gains more control and power and necessarily the institutions relinquish some of that power and control in the interest of the collective benefit and impact of the overall project. There is an opportunity for universities to be leaders in centering equity in development in frankly the same ways that universities, government, local government, federal government, and affordable housing developers decided to lead the market in green development about 20 years ago. The challenge is to go all in on the centering and to really reframe in terms of community self-determination, regeneration, reparation, reconciliation, and, and liberation. This calls for a creative articulation of what we value and imagining what value would be brought to all members of a community where equity was centered for its own sake. And so um, I will leave you, or I guess kick off the, the conversation with some reflection questions for this community. Sure, so you, you guys have some options to answer these questions. You can, if you have, um, any thoughts on, on the first question? How have you engaged your community in the past and how does this framework differ? You can drop your comments in the Q&A or in the chat. And if you'd like to elaborate, we can also call on you so you can share your thoughts with the group as well. So how have you engaged your community in the past? How does this framework differ? 
Yeah, I would think that um, for a lot of universities, the um, there has been a lot of community engagement process, but it may um, it may not have been. It probably has not been as um, deep into centering equity or sharing power as Sarah has just described for us. Um, right. Jenny, Jenny, what what do you think about that? Yeah, see, I, I can kind of speak from experience. We have, um, as Sheila mentioned in my bio, we have 100 acres of land at UT Dallas that are still under consideration for, for what it's going to be, how we're going to develop it. And the conversations have been mostly based on, um, on value propositions, like how is this going to create revenue for the university? How are we going to spur and encourage innovation? And uh, to be honest, we haven't really had these conversations about what can we put on this land that will lead to a more equitable North Texas that will address the climate crisis. And so um, these are important questions that frankly haven't really come up in the university. And so um, it, 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 perhaps we should really change the way that we're that we're, we're looking at this 100 acres of land and the potential for it. So what, when you're going through that process, um, Teresa, the group that the group internally at the university who you're working with, um, you know, that second question about the skills and knowledge that they need to, to mm -hmm. deeply engage in the community, do you think those exist or what do we need to do to develop those? Great yeah. Question. Um, Excuse me. No, go, go ahead, Teresa. Teresa. Yes. Okay. Listen. Excellent question. Uh, thank you, Sarah. This has been such a an inspiring and um, thoughtful uh, presentation, and uh, I am all over it this morning because we are in the throes of submitting um, the framework and a proposal to do exactly what you are referring to today throughout some of our most marginalized communities across the state. So I'll be in touch with you. But back to your, your point, I think that as we begin to look at our institutions, and I'm talking about our minority serving institutions, I've been um, uh, uh, in the role of a professor and uh, administrator and executive uh, within HBCUs across the Southeast for nearly 30 years. I think that this is a time for us to begin to look at how do we change the game here? Yeah. Uh, we have, we have you know, been in the classroom, we have talked about these things, but you know, my work doesn't just rest in the classroom, it is really in the community. So uh, does your community have the skills and knowledge to do this? I would say that they probably do, but do they, I'm gonna reframe this a bit to say, do they know how to utilize their existing knowledge, their existing skills, in order to collectively and collaboratively do the work that is necessary within the, their our respective communities in order to change the game. Because what you're talking about, Sarah, is, is, is a game changer. And when we talk about social and economic justice, uh, the inequities that have occurred historically in particular within, the, within our Southern states, we have to make sure that our communities have the skills and the knowledge, first of all, to begin to work collaboratively. That's our number one problem. How do we cross the bridges to work collaboratively? Not in terms of education, as you said, but in terms of skills, in terms of, our, of, of interest. So yeah, so, so I, I think that you were on point. I think that as, as anchor institutions for our communities, 50% of our HBCUs lie within the opportunity zones. We have a tremendous opportunity here to make some things happen. And yeah. so I'll be reaching out to you, Sarah, because this is something that um, we can certainly uh, begin sharpening um, uh, within the state of Alabama. Uh, through Alabama A&M, which is an 1890 land grant research institution uh, with far-reaching tentacles. Uh, 
And so, yeah, thank you so, so very much for that. And I'm sorry, Sheila, but you kind of stroked me this morning. So, <laughs> well, I think, yeah, I mean, I think when we, when Sheila and Jenny and I were, um, we're talking about this, it, it really does occur to me that the university's role to play could be in, you know, getting the ball rolling, you know, to start in terms of a collective impact organization, you could think of the university kind of getting, you know, assembling the, the community members around, you know, convening um, groups around this idea um, and creating opportunities for knowledge transfer, for um, skill sharing. And, and that, that seems like a beautiful way for the, for the university to really intervene in this kind of framework and this kind of model in community, um, not to hold the power, but to, you know, um, you know, serve as literally serve as an incubator to that power and share it and hand it off very quickly afterwards. Um, what What are your thoughts about that, Teresa? Absolutely, I agree one hundred percent. I think that we certainly have the infrastructure, we have the expertise um, mm -hmm. and the wherewithal. I, I, I really think that our main focus now is to begin to reframe, uh, to bring the right people to the table with the right mindset in order to begin to make um, sustainable actions happen, sustainable and impactful actions happen, so yeah. I have a I question. Agree. I have a question that um, is is um, referred to on the slide, but I'm, I know that many universities all across the country have goals for closing equity gaps in um, in student success, and I have to wonder whether um, this kind of place based work for building a community that supports. Um, the broader mission of equity in, um, in a neighborhood and in a university, how might that tie to student outcomes, um, at, at, you know, for students, equity and student success? Um, Teresa or Jenny, do you have any thoughts about that? I, I'm trying to think of the, my experience at the University of Texas at Dallas, and, and we do have um, uh, student equity, diversity, equity, and inclusion is a major strategic priority at UT Dallas. Um, and thinking of, of student, I'm, I'm kind of stuck on this question. <laughs> I am. Um, I think I think Teresa or Sarah, do you guys have have any thoughts? Yeah. So let me just say that um, at our university and across the board uh, at uh, most other universities that I'm uh, affiliated with, we're really making a greater emphasis on uh, experimental or um, uh, ex external learning you know, type programs. Um, those uh, initiatives that get, our, that get our students out of the classroom into the real world, understanding how to negotiate, uh, how to navigate uh, the diverse um, landscapes um, is very, very key. And so when we talk about student success and equity in student success, I think that this framework and the uh, framework that you talked about, Sarah, is very key because that helps our students to develop a realistic perspective of what is like outside of the classroom. For example, the first day on the job, the student walks in to an, an environment where no one looks like he or she. So how do you begin to negotiate that? How do you begin to look beyond those differences and see the value in what really matters to bring about uh, fruition, uh, bring about impact uh, you know, to those organizations. So, so, so I think that the issue of, of economic and social justice runs very, very deep. Uh, and we know the historical context 
But right now we want to talk about, you know, how do we build these sustainable uh, initiatives? How do we build a very strong community engagement uh, such that power is less dominant, but that people accept people as they are and their contributions that they're able to bring, their, their value propositions that they're able to bring into the community. So, uh, so yeah, I, I, I really believe that in order for our students to be successful, uh, that it takes not only the academic prowess in the classroom, but it also takes a sense of engagement a sense of knowing how to deal with the larger universe that will quickly await them outside the four walls of that, of that university. And that's our responsibility, I believe. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. And I, and I think what this framework really tries to do is, um, you know, while, while, acknowledging you know all of the stressors in our in our world today but saying rather than um having uh equity much less racial equity take a back seat to that we're saying no actually this is the the priority and if we if we as universities take an active role in articulating what that might actually look like in a built environment, in a place making initiative that the university is in partnership with community um, on, uh, then that actually, um, and students are, you know, see that they, they live there, they walk through that, they have jobs there, they experience what that space, that place feels like and what that, um, how that lived experience then um, sort of shows up for them in the, in the university that they're attending that says that has all these lofty DEI goals or has this mission around um, creating a safe space if we see that then reflected in not just in the, the sort of safe space of the university, but also outside the university in community um, in action, I think that really starts to turn the wheels of what a just and, and right world could look like. And I think that's part of the, the hopefulness of this, of this idea, this, this message, this way of um, approaching development that universities can take a really active role in transforming communities that they're within, um, not in a, you know, in a, in a really upfront and central way. Thanks, Sarah. Before we lose folks, I, um, I want to just give Spencer a chance to launch our evaluation questions. So go, uh, please, if you're um, attending, please go ahead and um, answer those questions for us so that we can continue to improve our programming for Arnie. Um, and um, we are almost out of time. And I also just want to give people a heads up um, about our next webinar. So um, uh, Sarah, could you stop sharing your slide? Sure. Thanks. Um, so uh, my screen is very junky right now. Hold on. Um, so I just want to provide some um, some information about our next webinar. Um, our next convening will be, um, we'll have a, our guest will be Dr. Tim Bardick from the Upjohn Institute. He'll be talking about improving place-based policy for distressed places. Um, very um, uh, appropriate for um, the, uh, to continue the conversation that we've had today. So please join us on September 7th. Um, for that discussion. Um, and then also um, our, um, oh, you're not seeing, hmm. let's see. Apparently people are not seeing my slides, but um, I'm not exactly sure why. So um, let's see. Um, I also wanna remind people of the summit that is happening. 
Okay, I'm not sure what happened. I, th I think we lost uh, Sheila there, but um, the UIDA Summit for 2022 is going to be October 9th through the 12th um, in San Antonio, Texas. And of course, our EA Day for Arnie is going to be on that Sunday, the 9th. Um, if you have a, we have a one more minute left. Uh, if anybody wants to um, uh, continue answering the feedback questions, that would be great. Thank you to all of our speakers and presenters. We really appreciate uh, the presentation you've done today. We will get the recording out to everybody um, that registered as well as attended. Um, so thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Have a great day.